Greetings to all my fellow Sith posters out there. This is DS Lyons of the Movie Blues. And that's it. This is the second and final time I'm making a Star Wars video. It's 2023. Nobody likes movie reviewers. Nobody wants a real f***ing review of anything. No critique is ever going to be truly objective to the mob anymore. Sorry, Mauler. Their rules, not mine. And if you really want to know what movies to see these days, all you really need to know is how much they hurt people's feelings. Especially if they're people you already hate, then it's even easier. I make pizza, it's great. It sucks, You're actually. You're a fucking joke. Oh, the child abduction propaganda movie owned all the libs? Buy me a ticket, thank you, Jesus. Oh, the new Marvel movie is starring three diverse female characters and it made Ben Shapiro cry like a baby into his sister's mega pillows? Buy me a ticket, my hair is blue. At this point, the Rotten Tomato critical score has become more overwrought with drama and accusations than the Boy Scouts of America. I was amazed at how big that number got. 82,000 victims, which is just my blood. This was an abomination. And in this climate of fake news and no truth, how else can you judge what the best Star Wars movie is unless you know how much it offended some neck-bearded crybaby on YouTube? Guys, it's so boring. It, it it's so boring it's it's just be it's a i shouldn't say it's a planned out narrative but it does have a plot to it therefore and without further pomp and circumstance here is a ranking of every single theatrical star wars film based on how much they hurt me now before you bomb straight into the comments to ask who hurt me the answer is ryan johnson star wars kathleen kennedy and the youtube algorithm expecting someone else <laughs> now that we've got that out of the way let's start off with clearly the least offensive star wars film and the first one on my list episode four a new hope i mean come on how are you really going to be mad at the first of something truly great like anchor bar the restaurant in buffalo new york that invented buffalo wings i've been there and their wings are phenomenal but you know some dick somewhere had to find some other buffalo wing spot and say that it's better than Anchor Bar. Now, are there better wings out there now that there's been decades of progress in the wing field? I'm a big time chicken wing freak. I go to every wing place I find. I get the wings at any restaurant that I am at. And I am telling you, I'm not a big man. I had at least 50 wings so far today and I'm not done. But Anchor Bar did it first. They invented that timeless flavor using nothing but a little ingenuity, some butter and some hot sauce. Just like George built Star Wars out of spray-painted tampons and egg crates. And bam, all wings everywhere owe their delicious little bits to the geniuses of Buffalo, New York. Are there people out there who think they can do better than the guy that invented this shit? I mean, this doofus probably thought he had the best wing sauce since Uncle Georgie's original recipe, and guess what? He did not. So yeah, don't get butt hurt over A New Hope, y'all. I can't even invent a way to get butt hurt over A New Hope. And don't tell me that Empire did it better. I'm sorry, it just did not. A New Hope is that perfect chicken wing, phenomenal skin crisp, perfect butter to hot sauce ratio, cooked to exquisiteness. And the interior is that soft, moist, beautiful, delicately cooked chicken, so it's phenomenal. No complaints, no hurt feelings. And it's the only one of these godforsaken movies to not offend me in one way or another. Episode five, The Empire Strikes Back. Is the offspring. Sometimes having a long-standing relationship with something really good can kinda sour once you begin looking at it a little closer. Like the overpaid pilots to Epstein Island after they started really reading the crew manifests. And with The Empire Strikes Back, we begin the chain of hurt feelings that cascades down the halls of my damaged headcanon to this very day. The Empire Strikes Back is a nearly perfect Star Wars film, but the Vader reveal opened a can of worms that every single Star Wars movie afterward felt the need to copy. So while Empire is the second best Star Wars film ever, it kind of hurts me, it kind of pisses off my little baby brain that the wide open possibilities of an endless galaxy were suddenly limited to the drama of one goddamn family for every movie for the rest of the damn franchise. After Empire, the expectation to top, or at the very least reproduce its twist, hampered the size of the canvas of this series to this day. Without Empire, you wouldn't have J.J. Abrams making Rey Palpatine's granddaughter. There would be no expectation or need for such a knuckle-brained twist. 
Anyway, other than some bad compositing, some 80s anachronistic haircuts, and some hints into the truly listless nature of the quote-unquote plan that these movies were following by, Empire is near perfection, but as you can see, it's starting to rev my cry engines a little bit. Rogue One, a Star Wars story. You dumped me! I was 16! Remember when Disney accidentally made a good Star Wars movie? Oh, it's beautiful. I mean, they tried to ruin it. They fucked with director Gareth Edwards and probably made him sign more NDAs than a kid leaving a sleepover at Neverland Ranch. Regardless, this is one of the least offensive Star Wars movies ever. It's gorgeous, badass, full of color and rich characters, and it finally made Darth Vader into the kind of big dick swinging maniac that we always knew he was. I love this movie, I love Rogue One, so how did it hurt my feelings? Well, my little baby nappy gets all wet when I think about not the film itself, but the public's reaction to Rogue One. A lot of people say that the fan base split down the middle when The Last Jedi came out in 2016, but I don't think that that's factually correct. The real split began arguably in The Force Awakens, but was truly amplified by the release of Rogue One right after. When popular outlets like Red Letter Media dismissed Rogue One, probably the best theatrical Star Wars film since Return of the Jedi, as fan service junk, well, that's when the birth of the salt that makes up my baby tears began to develop in my cry glands. The Death Star, and they didn't do that. These characters are boring. This one got Star Wars wrong, in my opinion. Uh what? Bro, what are you talking about, man? Still to this day, people dismiss, disregard, and disqualify Rogue One. And it's probably the same herd of dum-dums who think that The Last Jedi is the best thing since Trader Joe's croissant bread. You gotta try this stuff, it's so good. Regardless, Rogue One represents a sore spot in Star Wars history that was only continued by the low viewership numbers of Andor. Apparently, if something is really good, nobody gives a shit. But if something is really bad, well, it also gets low viewership, but way more memes. Long and short, we did not deserve Rogue One, and it really twists my tampon that people can somehow praise shit like this Ezra. while missing shit like this. <laughs> Return of the Jedi. <laughs> Let's talk about Yub Nub Erasure. Guys, you had this absolutely slamming ass track going so fucking hard. And why did you have to get rid of it? Yub Nub is not only a slapping ass cut, but did anyone at the Lucasfilm Movie Changes Department think about the fact that an entire generation of kids grew up with Yub Nub as a Pavlovian response trigger that made us all feel like we were home, safe at the end of an incredible journey, celebrating in our successes. And ever since the special editions happened, Return of the Jedi has turned into this blank slate of baseless and disgusting additions, changes, and whatever the fuck this is. Return of the Jedi hurts my feelings because this entire nightmare experiment of a franchise should have and could have ended right here, with a good old-fashioned Vader barbecue and a whole lot of yub nub. Instead, this movie has turned into some kind of fester point for the worst kind of Star Wars fans, the kind of soulless shills who decided that Ahsoka is somehow worth a shit, but it's still cool to bash on Return of the Jedi because what? a Star Wars movie wanted to produce toys and because of these damn teddy bears? This movie, uh, for the record, has just about as many fuzzy little dudes as any other fucking Star Wars movie, except these ones lead a rather interesting slave revolt that is far more engaging than any Porg storyline. I mean, the only purpose of the Porgs was to be cannibalized by this absolute fuzz unit, but no, this is a problem. As an entry into the Skywalker saga, Return of the Jedi is fantastic. It has an absolutely iconic heist opening, a truly emotional and resonant and beautifully mounted finale. The things that actually hurt my feelings from this one, um, besides what has been done to it posthumously, is the first instance of trying to top Empire with another familial twist. You have that power too. In time, you'll learn to use it as I have. And the blatant disrespect of Boba Fett, a character who has gone on to be blatantly disrespected in every other form of media afterward. I, I don't know if this was like the first instance of abuse, like we opened the floodgates to abusing this man. But yeah, uh, 
great movie and and probably the last movie on this list to not like outwardly just destroy me internally for years and make me upset so uh yub nub baby star wars episode three revenge of the sith Have the high ground. So this is the first of two Star Wars films that I consider to be quote unquote course corrections for the Star Wars franchise. I have the high You underestimate my power. There have been two instances where a Star Wars film has saved an entire trilogy from the precipice of utter uselessness. And one of those films is Episode 3, Revenge of the Sith. Think we'll ever get a chance to redeem this franchise? This episode was our last hope. After the rocky response to Star Wars Episode 1, people were complaining that Darth Vader was a whiny little kid. Called Sebulba. Boy is right. You're heading into trouble. Thanks, my young friend. Young goat. I, I like him. A little dude got balls to be so young. After the rocky response of Episode 2, people were complaining that Darth Vader was a whiny, slightly bigger kid. Look at this dude. <laughs> Wait till you see the. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> so when episode three came out, true Star Wars fans only wanted to see one thing. The return of fucking Dexter's baby, a sitcom on Disney Plus taking place at Dexter's. Uh, Paramount Plus presents the new season of Dexter v. Frasier taking place in a diner where everyone knows your name. I've got news for you. Copernicus called, and you are not the center of the universe. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, the only thing people wanted to see by the time episode three came out was an Anakin Skywalker that we could fear, that we could feasibly see turn into the vacuum-lunged mega-Nazi that we all grew to fear and love as kids. So, in some ways, the villain transformation paid off the plasticine disaster that was Attack of the Clones. But in other ways, this movie is still a fucking joke. A Jedi taking over! When you've mined every millimeter of a film for memes, that's when you gotta realize that you aren't exactly dealing with Shakespeare. Still, old George finally paid off a generation of fan expectations for the fight between Vader and Obi. And even though this is the best prequel film from the trilogy by a country bear's mile, it's still a film that hurts my feelings. Had the rest of the trilogy had even one eighth of the emotional potency as this one montage, the impact of this final entry could have been one of the biggest cinematic moments in history. I mean, what did it take for George to stay out of this scene? I kind of imagine him bound and gagged slightly off camera while Steven Spielberg secretly directs his one scene of the trilogy. Instead, the final crescendo of an entire Star Wars trilogy kind of boils down to a hilarious exercise in dick swinging. And any person that goes to bat for this film as some piece of dramatic history has to rectify their praise with shit like this. So yeah, I mean, this is the most three-dimensional prequel Star Wars movie. I mean, it doesn't exactly look like a screensaver for most of its runtime. And I would say that the characters have, like, a uh, small shadow of depth that I appreciate in this one. And it's kind of like when you have a terrible argument with your spouse and you know that you'll never fix the damage that was made, but at least you come to some kind of reconcilable agreement where you can have makeup sex. That's episode three. That is the course correction. It's, it's fine. The movie's fine. It's the best of the prequels. It's fine. Episode nine, the rise of Skywalker. All right, time to lose, uh, I don't know, ha more than half, more than half of my audience. Gonna for sure look back at my audience retention rate statistic and watch it drop off at this exact moment. But yeah, The Rise of Skywalker is the second course correction Star Wars film in the franchise. And you might be, I mean, you probably are one of those utter geniuses who thinks that Rise of Skywalker ruined The Last Jedi. And it's okay to be wrong. Literally nobody's perfect. Love him or hate him, J.J. Abrams was essentially the George Lucas of the sequel trilogy. Hey guys. Let's let the chills go all the way down your spine. Good, good, good. And while that probably makes you slightly sick, it's a fact that you cannot ignore. I mean, it's simply true. Logically, if anybody deviated from the plan, what little of it there was, it was Ryan Johnson. Sure, there weren't any written laws about where the sequel series was headed, and Ryan had every right to follow his own vision. But I'm gonna guess that when JJ designed Maz Kanata, Supreme Leader Snoke, General Hux, and even Finn, that he didn't expect for all that character work, all that 
that design work, all that world building to be thrown away like every other mixed salad bag you've bought at the grocery store and let rot. Rise of Skywalker was not only a course correction towards the abandoned world building of The Force Awakens, but it was also a quick fix for the thrown lightsaber, for Luke's character assassination, for Rey's parentage, and so much more. Frankly, one of the least praised and most important corrections that J.J. tried inserting here was giving a sense of camaraderie and adventure to a trilogy full of characters that we barely knew and who got utterly dismantled and disrespected by The Last Jedi. Is this film some perfect fix to the sinking ship? Um, no, but it's basically a bucket to bail water out, and it was better than nothing. How are you? I am under the water. Please help me. The reason that this film is rated as less offensive on this list than The Force Awakens for me, uh, it's simple. Rise of Skywalker actually added some new ideas to the franchise. Unlike Force Awakens, which just introduced us to remixes of things we've already seen, like fake Vader, fake Han, fake Luke, fake Palpatine, fake Death Star, and on and on. And don't tell me The Last Jedi did any better with its fake Hoth, its fake Yoda, its fake Yoda death and on and on. Whereas Rise of Skywalker introduced interesting concepts like Exegol, Sith holocrons, the zombie emperor, and most importantly, fucking Babu Frick. This guy. He is cuter and funnier and more wholesome than any Porg or any your mom joke from The Last Jedi. Fucking love you. Fucking love you, babe. I'm not saying that Rise of Skywalker was some well of originality, but at least it ran with the ideas of dark science and cloning from the prequel trilogy to their natural endpoint. I mean, people seem to obsess over how utterly random Palpatine's return was, but like, was it? Palpatine basically sat the most important villain down in the entire saga and deadass explained to him that he could resurrect people from the dead. It kind of retroactively makes the already fantastic opera scene from the prequels even more ominous and foreboding than it already was. And there's nothing funnier to me than people getting so offended by Palpatine masterminding his posthumous return. I mean, this dude reverse engineered three separate wars, uh, hoodwinked an entire generation of Jedi into thinking he wasn't capable of a flying 920. Y'all, the point of this character from his inception is that he is a mastermind who plays the entire galaxy against itself effortlessly. And now suddenly it's impossible to believe that he would return from the grave to complete his dastardly deeds. I don't know, the complaints about this movie and the hate for it simply don't match up with the rest of the sequel trilogy. In fact, if anything, I think this movie and The Force Awakens should be allowed to retroactively switch scores. Much like Rogue One, a lot of what hurts my feelings about this movie was its reception. The same people that drank The Force Awakens up like it was Cambodian breast milk are somehow the same people who think that this movie was a lifeless disaster. And it's gonna be a long time, forever, until I can rectify that in my mind. Rise of Skywalker made it actually fun to watch these new characters in a Star Wars movie. It introduced a couple new ideas. It capped things off in the best way that it could, considering that the wheels had already flown off the car and the transmission was already shot. So yeah, this is the worst Star Wars movie to some of you people, my God, please. Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace. Okay, people, if you've made it this far, you are now officially on the back half of the Star Wars movies that hurt my little baby brain the most. From here on out, Oh, the feelings are kind of nothing but hurt. It's just a question of how badly. This is no longer about reception or public consensus or originality. From here on out, these are the Star Wars movies that make me want to take my Jango Fett minifig and burn him alive. Oh, Jesus Christ. It's not even Jango Fett. It's Mandalorian Warrior. Oh my God, get it together. Star Wars Episode One was a film experience, a monumental moment in pop culture history, and the last time ever that Star Wars fans would think it was a good idea to expand the franchise. I could, and many people on the internet right now, could probably go on forever about how this movie defined our childhoods, about how its adjoining games were some of the best in Star Wars history. What's up, Jedi Power Battles on Dreamcast, you nearly impossible bitch, you? 
But I'm not here to discuss pop culture impact. I'm here to let you know that this movie absolutely unraveled me as a Star Wars fan. And with every subsequent viewing, it only kind of gets worse. I really need to hold on to the pod racing sequence and the amount of incredible practical sets in this film to not end up completely shitting on it. Because other than its eye-bursting aesthetics, The Phantom Menace title... I still don't understand the title, is a spectacularly goofy failure in almost every respect. About as dramatically potent as a cardboard cutout, The Phantom Menace made one of the most bizarre mistakes slash flexes in cinematic history. It misunderstood the strengths of its own series. Growing up, most kids would tell you that there were two kinds of space wars worth investing your time into, Star Trek and Star Wars. One of these journeys was a complex, scientific, sterile, and intellectually superior product. Your simple shoot him up mind just can't handle these complex, nuanced Boring. issues. Boring. Oh yeah, your stuff is so nuanced. Be nice to Data and don't be racist to aliens. There, I solved Star Trek. While the other star stuff was known for its heart, characters, and dismissal of hard science in place of fantasy adventure. What the creators, or creator, of The Phantom Menace seemed to miss was that nobody was into Star Wars for cells under a microscope and morally gray shipping quandaries. Oh. I feel like I'm in science class, but I'm getting dumber. Do you want to talk about pseudoscience? Midichlorines, then. That doesn't count. How about politics? The Galactic Senate, then. Doesn't count either. Will you defer your motion to allow a commission to explore the validity of your accusations? That is like specifically a Star Trek vibe that did not need to creep its way into a story about wizards and hobbits. It would be like if Lord of the Rings suddenly grinded to a halt to explain the economic impact that the industrialization of Mordor specifically had on trade routes. Nobody wanted to see the Ents join a labor union. Nobody needed an explanation of the Rings using science and hokum bullshit. It's terrible. This is proof that it's terrible. Nobody wanted this. <laughs> Outside of the pod racing sequence, this movie has just a distinct lack of fun. Which is so bizarre, like why focus this entry on the youngest protagonist in the entire series thus far, if you're gonna suck all the wonder and fun out of the room and make this a sterile, boring movie for adults? It's like George calibrated this movie to confuse kids and piss off their parents. Which is the exact opposite of his entire mantra behind Star Wars really being for the next generation of kids. Now, of course, between this and the Clone Wars, the collective pummeling of the 90s into 2000s generation with prequel merch and iconography, the Star Wars prequels did end up eventually capturing a generation, mostly against their will. As iconic as Episode One is, as much as it defined the much dumber generation of kids underneath me, imagine for a second, what the world would be like if this movie was actually good. What the prequel trilogy could have been like if this movie was actually good. Let's say this movie starts uh, when Anakin is a teenager. Have episode one be the plot of episode two and then have him switch to Vader midway through episode two and then episode three, first year as Vader and all of the ramifications across the galaxy. I mean, what a more mature and interesting to OT fans approach that could have been opposed to this. <laughs> I guess we'll never know. I mean, I know, I'm telling you it would have been better. Episode seven, The Force again. It's a Guavian death gang. Must attract us from then to... What's a rat call? A long time ago, 
in a galaxy that is an immediately recognizable safe space to fans of the OT. Comes a movie that felt good to watch until you took even one second to consider the damaging wow. implications to the world building set up in the first six Star Wars movies. I said take off those damn glasses. The Force Awakens is simultaneously a reboot of A New Hope while somehow unraveling everything set up by the characters in A New Hope. You see, with the Empire from the original trilogy, even though we didn't get all the information up front, within moments we still understood their progress, their rise to evil, their scrambling for more resources and control, and their continually escalating power. Take the Death Star, for example. I mean, this is in the first movie. This was clearly the Empire's pride and joy, and we know that because everyone is all horny for its demonstration of power. And we understand that this is a new step in the might and total control of the Empire over the galaxy. We see people struggle to make this thing a reality. We see how hard it was to construct this absolute unit of a battle station in all forms of Star Wars media. From the episode of Rebels where there's a mission to collect the Kyber Crystal for the Death Star, to the construction of the Firing Ring dish in Andor, to the preview of its might a near generation earlier in episode two. So there's precedence here. We see that the Death Star not only took a full generation to plan and construct, but we also understand that this is the Empire's apogee of power, their mightiest weapon. Now, this thing, on the other hand, and I had to look up the name because it's probably the stupidest fucking name since Unobtainium. Unobtainium. This thing... Uh, Star Killer Base is a planet-sized Death Star. This thing is an absolute monster that makes even the larger Death Star from Return of the Jedi look like a goddamn kidney stone. And how and where and when and with what resources was this built with specifically? Just this. I mean, there's so many more resources that we see from the First Order in this movie, but how was this done? How did they manage to construct this thing so quickly? Who was able to undertake such a seismically massive project without anyone in the New Republic noticing? A bum kid who had a panic attack and had to leave charm school early? This fucking dumbass? And this equation, this slight investigation of a single piece of lore from this movie, this is a problem that goes all the way across the board. At least with his Star Trek reboot, J.J. was smart enough to just set it in a different universe. Here you go, Kelvin universe. Now the anachronisms of the original Star Trek series and the shittiness of their tech could be wiped out with no questions asked. Obviously. This movie, though, this did the exact same thing. It rebooted itself and changed all the rules and all the planets and all the characters while remaining so slavish to the OT, which it seemingly hates while trying to emulate. When people say that The Last Jedi and The Rise of Skywalker are bipolar, well, The Force Awakens is that childhood trauma that later manifested in life into serious mental health struggles. It began here. That is the biggest problem with this movie. It's not the simple and unified vision that many seem to paint it as when it came out. It, like the rest of the sequel trilogy, is a movie just endlessly at odds with its own series, its own lore, its own internal logic, and its own new and milquetoast characters. As David Eight once so eloquently put it, Big, big things, things have small beginnings. beginnings. And there are so many seeds of ultimately unresolved conflict in this movie that only fester and rot outward. I think this movie would have been a lot better if it never got any sequels. If Disney just like ceased to exist after this movie came out, then at least we would have the mystery. Then at least we would still have hope uh, before the subsequent two movies pissed on whatever was left. Solo, a Star Wars story. Okay, so first of all, if you are part of the 25% of the audience that forgot that there was a Han Solo movie, take this next segment as a grim reminder. All Disney had to do is ask me, or ask any Star Wars fan at the time, and we would have told them that this was a bad idea. I don't think anyone really wanted this. Surely it's an objective fact that no one needed it. But if it absolutely needed to exist, then we deserve to see what the original directors, Lord and Miller, were going to bring to the table. We saw over 3,000 people. Turns out uh, that that 
was a total waste of money. It's very cliche to say that it's a dream come true. You know, growing up, you didn't even think it was possible to direct a Star Wars movie. You didn't even think that was something that was possible to do. Had Solo been a colorful, cracking improv comedy set in a Star Wars Underworld 1313 type of universe, and not this horrendously boring, inconceivably brown-looking movie, we may have had something actually unique to look back on. Who knows, it could have been like a buddy cop comedy with Han and Chewie. It could have been an Ocean's Eleven style space caper set on Canto Bight where Lando is head of a casino. It could have been a white knuckle race for a smuggling prize like The Amazing Race, with the best bounty hunters and smugglers in the galaxy going head to head, where we get to see Han becoming the cunning and charming hero we always knew that he was. Instead we got this. Oh, my sackle occipital circuit is sticking. You're gonna have to do that thing again later. Yeah. All right. Costa Castle is set. I get that Lucasfilm was basically in a full-on tailspin at this point, but I thought that the reason, or at least the purpose, behind a new generation of Star Wars filmmakers was to bring in a new generation of Star Wars filmmakers. Also, you know, it's just, yeah, it's, it's crazy to think that you were able to, that this is what we do for our jobs. For me, the experience. Look at me in the windows to my soul. Shut the fuck up. Replacing Lord and Miller with Ron Howard, maybe the baldest and safest movie director of all time, wasn't so much an inspired choice as it was a white flag thrown up in surrender. Hi, I'm Ron Howard. I'll be directing from here on out. I'll take care of everything. Okay. Solo is probably the most useless fat on the Disney bone of any project they've dipped their toes into. None of the end credit teasers, inspired new castings, or useless new side characters have shown up in any worthwhile capacity in the canon since. I mean, I'm sure there's plenty of like Kira novels and stands out there somewhere, but like, it's, ew. That's worse than I thought it was in my ad. And this woman, just a side note here, but this woman is just the most notorious franchise killer out there right now. Like people still want to know who the Zodiac was when there's a real killer out on the loose. I'm a Rastafarian, Targaryen. I got some dragons and they are very scary. Yeah. Khaleesi's reign of terror is admittedly quite impressive, beginning with the torching of her own series, Game of Thrones, before moving on to torch the Terminator series, with her entry being an absolute dud that led nowhere. Come with me if you want to live. I don't think you have the facilities for that big man. <laughs> and then she moved on to Marvel with an entry that was an absolute dud and went somewhere. You're weak. Hmm. Just waiting for her role to be announced in Rings of Power season two. How did any consenting adult sit in the theater when this one came out and somehow made it through the whole what is your name origin for old Han? I could feel the collective groan of all pop culture releasing in the cinema when this line happened. And from there, this movie doesn't exactly get much better. Besides the film's oppressively garish brownness, I mean, what the fuck was anyone thinking in the dailies when they saw how hideous this movie was? Solo suffers from so many instances of contrivance, convenience, and plot armor that it's frankly exhausting to try to enjoy the good bits in between all the mayhem. This movie offends me with its insistence on existing, yet its inability to bring anything new or consequential to the table. The casting in this movie is so fucking distracting, I just couldn't understand why Woody Harrelson is in the Star Wars universe now. You wanna know how I've survived as long as I have? I trust no one. Assume everyone will betray you and you will never be disappointed. The reason I like herb more than alcohol is because it makes me feel good, no hangover, and I never wake up covered in blood. Sounds like a long night way to live. It's the only way. But I guess if we have to accept Benicio Del Toro and Dr. Ellie Sattler, I can try to overlook this. If Ron Howard wanted to make a Star Wars film, he should have like made one during the prequel trilogy because this movie is so geriatric and so lifeless that it feels like something my deceased Bubby would have left on Turner classic movies by accident instead of a thrilling space opera. Anyway, whatever, fuck this movie. Can I say that? And like this, sh this shit. 
with Lando fucking his goddamn spaceship. It's never going to it's never going to go away. I still look at the Millennium Falcon and see it a little differently. Um I it, ugh, that happened. That's forever. That is forever. They really did that, didn't they? Episode 2, Attack of the Clones. Bada bop boom pow. Long time ago in a galaxy far far away and it continues. Star Wars Episode 2, Attack of the Clones, is the worst directed, least tactile, most lifeless Star Wars movie ever made. And I feel like I've always had proof of this. I've always known this since the day the film came out. See, back in 2002, I was still a huge Star Wars fan, but I was also a pretty worried one. Having grown a few years older and somewhat wiser since the release of the emotionally blinding and wildly entertaining experience of seeing Episode 1, things had already begun to sour in the Star Wars universe. By the time Episode 2 approached, a lot of people's beer goggles had worn off when it came to The Phantom Menace, and many people were finally seeing the swamp donkey of a movie left over when the lights finally turned on in the club. So leading into Episode 2, I was fully aware that both Lucasfilm and Star Wars history needed a hit from this one, and needed a film that had shown some sort of overall maturation progress from the sterility of the previous entry. You're trapped in an impossible situation with no means of escape. It was in this state of panic that I traveled to my local Barnes & Noble about three days before the release of the film. And lo and behold, the official graphic novelization of Attack of the Clones had already been released. Unable to exercise even a moment of willpower, and still to this day, I bought this book and brought it home immediately to determine if Star Wars was about to fall off its final cliff. To my surprise, Attack of the Clones, in its comic form, was a vast improvement over the story and tone of The Phantom Menace. I mean, right from the outset, this movie started with a terrorist attack that yielded casualties, followed by a white-knuckle mission to protect Padme from certain assassination by a conflicted and passionate Jedi whose love for the Senator had already begun clouding his thoughts. This book followed a story of love, loss, revenge, regret, and pain as Darth Vader's initial descent into madness kicks off a proxy war started by an utter lunatic. All of the makings of a tremendous Star Wars film are right here, and by the time I finished the novel's final engrossing page, I was astounded at this dark, more grounded, grittier take on the prequel world that felt like a step toward the former glory and severity of the series. And then, two days later, I saw the movie on opening night after telling all my friends to gear up for this gritty descent into evil. Another full step towards the creation of the world's most recognizable villain. And instead, we got... Uh wrought with melodrama, horrendous acting, stilted line reads, and absolutely one-dimensional effects are all systematic issues with Attack of the Clones that were unpredictable after reading the graphic novel. The seriousness and gravity of Anakin's character arc in the comic held absolutely no weight in the film that looked like a sequel to Spy Kids, starring actors who were all giving line deliveries as if they were locked in a freezer all night before the cameras rolled. There is such an obvious insistence on the visuals and technological leaps being made behind the camera in this one, and almost all of those changes seem to branch from Lucas's want to do less work overall. With Empire, Lucas shifted his directing duties to someone who had a more open schedule on their hands, and with Attack of the Clones, Lucas seemed to shift his directing duties onto whatever computer had the most RAM at Lucasfilm. Uh, this is just a sort of an expedient way of of being able to cut the film before it's shot. And whatever, Dooku is still a shit villain and probably should have still been Darth Maul. All the romance stuff is absolutely unconscionable, and Karate Yoda is only cool like the first time you see it. And then when you think about it for like five seconds afterward, it really is so stupid. <laughs> But one of the things to offend me most about this movie was the sheer audacity to call it Attack of the Clones, when the movie ends with Yoda saying, Begun, the Clone War has. That is such a bizarre misdirect. I mean, the whole movie's plot is about a forbidden love affair and the death of Anakin's mother, but the title of the movie suggests that this really is a war movie 
And it's a war we're never going to see. And yes, we were promised that that war would take place in some sort of cartoon series, but we also knew from A New Hope that the Clone Wars would probably be the most definitive backdrop to all the most pivotal moments in Obi and Anakin's relationship. And like, we end up not being privy to that at all. And when episode three picks up, the most important character depth has already been handled off screen. And speaking of that off screen handling. <laughs> Star Wars, The Clone Wars. And it would be three years until we actually got that character work that was so sorely missing in the prequels. And by three years, I mean five years, because The Clone Wars movie came out three years after Revenge of the Sith. Everybody out there on the internet right now is begging Lucasfilm to let Filoni take over and to let Filoni direct his own Star Wars movie. But like, that literally already happened. In 2008, the first few episodes of the Clone Wars TV show were woven together to form a theatrical release. This decision helped convince WB parent company Time Warner to distribute the movie and encourage its subsidiary Cartoon Network to air the series. Lucas described the film as, quote, almost an afterthought, uh, said Howard Rothman, uh, president of Lucas Licensing. And uh, he said of George's decision at the time, sometimes George works in strange ways. And in this case, Lucas's strange ways were just making bad creative decisions. The show was so clearly not ready for a theatrical adaptation, although one could only wonder how incredible this would have been if they would have been given the proper time and resources. It could have been an incredible TV to film adaptation late into the series maturity, like Batman Mask of the Phantasm or X-Files or Star Trek The Next Generation. Instead, we have a rushed, hideous, stilted, and frankly fucking annoying movie. <laughs> full of horrendous creative decisions and enough cringe to sink the Titanic. Not only did I walk into the theaters to see this one wondering what was so much better than Tartakovsky's Clone Wars that Lucas went with instead of that, but I also showed up to finally see the camaraderie between Master and Apprentice that we had waited all these years for. And instead we got the camaraderie between the wrong master and the wrong apprentice. Ahsoka Tano is such a lore-breaking, eye-rolling, retcon addition to the prequel lore. And I don't care how well-fleshed out she's become, because if any character from the prequels got 40-plus hours of screen time, they'd probably be better fleshed out, too. That doesn't change how utterly obnoxious, clueless, annoying, and unhinged this character is in this film. Master Yoda hadn't heard from you, so he sent me to deliver the message. Maybe you can relay a signal through the cruiser that just dropped me off. Even with some of the most challenging Star Wars films, I always left the theater feeling like I had seen something substantial. I left this movie more confused, angry, and resentful of the prequels than honestly ever before. Nobody back then was on that Filoni is a genius bullshit. We literally wanted to kill this man even more than most Star Wars fans already wanted to kill George. And sure, he redeemed himself with some of the best episodes of The Clone Wars and with some of the best episodes of Rebels. But again, that might be a mere product of statistics because both of those shows have about 50 hours each of episodes that add absolutely nothing to the lore. In fact, Clone Wars mires some of its best seasons, with Jar Jar episodes, entire arcs starring solely droids, and you could say that the Clone Wars only got better and better, but I have two sisters with the last name Martez that prove that Filoni's work remained spotty to the end. And <clears throat> to this day. I do trust Filoni. Um, I do think that he has the vision and skill to herald the next generation of Star Wars stories. But if you think my dude is batting a thousand, then you, just like me, know nothing about baseball. This movie is an absolute eyesore, a childish and dinky addition to the canon that would have been better suited on the editing room floor, or just on a little square TV where it belonged. This was the first piece of content to truly break through the noise following the end of the prequel trilogy, and it was like having the bad taste spit back into my mouth after Revenge of the Sith offered only a momentary breath mint. Last motherfucking Jedi, baby. Probably 
not only because of process of elimination, but I mean, my God. For me, everything in the movie is Star Wars. And it, everything in the movie I can trace back to deeply in a deep way what Star Wars is for me. The greatest teacher failure is... Let me ask you this. Why do we test medicines on animals? Of course, there's the most obvious response to see if a given medicine will actually work on a mammal's nervous and immune system. But what people often forget is that there is another far darker reason to test medicine on rats and monkeys and mice. It's those pesky side effects. They are not only testing for the proficiency of the core drug, they're testing to see what other horrors, what other ramifications, what other scars and bodily curses will be produced by using a given product. What The Last Jedi could have used, ultimately, was animal testing. Not to see if the film itself was truly effective, I mean, arguably a lot of people found it to be rather compelling, but instead we needed more research on what the other side effects could be caused by the core medication. If a lab found a vaccine that worked perfectly, but in its animal trials it also caused priapism, an unwanted, painful, persistent erection, I was supposed to have a big night that is not caused by sexual stimulation or arousal, but when left untreated, tissue damage can occur, resulting in the inability to get or maintain an erection. Well, then the vaccine would be shelved, reworked, recoded, retested. Anyone with even a passing degree in Star Wars ology could have told you that no matter how effective the story of The Last Jedi was, the side effects were bound to be so cataclysmic, so dangerous, so irresponsible, and it's so obvious that it's hard to believe that the drug ever went to trial. The Last Jedi may have made for a solid Star Wars tale. I mean, I don't think so. I think the film is a foul and brainless piece of shit. Very kind of you to make me aware. But in case you are a Last Jedi diehard, I'm here to tell you that your edgy little middle finger to the Star Wars movies may have been fun while it lasted, but it absolutely tanked the nervous system of the entire Star Wars series in the process. <laughs> Much like Ebola Zaire, The Last Jedi literally killed everything it came in contact with, making its victims' innards liquefy into a hefty blood and fecal mix that empty out of every single orifice available. Luke's character was disrespected and ditched, the most pivotal twist moment of the previous film was treated as a joke, the best new characters of the series were reduced to sniveling, bumbling, sex-crazed freaks. I mean, I've been bitching about this movie for as long as I can remember at this point, and ultimately, this video will probably keep causing haters to wonder, who hurt you? But I'd like to redirect that question directly to Ryan Johnson. Dude, who hurt you? Did someone in a Luke Skywalker Halloween costume beat you up as a kid? Did J.J. Abrams, like, spit in your coffee? Did the guy who initially designed Supreme Leader Snoke draw a picture of you with a weird wiener? I mean, who did you so wrong that you felt the need to dismantle something beautiful when it needed stability the most? The world waited with bated breath to see where the Star Wars universe was heading, to see new worlds and possibilities that we could explore after The Force Awakens teed up so many different avenues. And your solution was what? A casino planet and a kid with a broom? Light commentary on greed and labor abuse while you're actively making a movie for the biggest franchise in the world produced by the most insidious corporation to ever make movies? We're with the Resistance. I mean, if you hated Disney, if you hated Star Wars, why did you make a Disney Star Wars movie? Couldn't we have hired somebody whose plan wasn't to flip the entire table over and not even suggest a new game afterward? Here comes a big wave! <laughs> Who lets a bumbling fuck nugget saunter into Lucasfilm headquarters and decide, with no checks and balances, with no mammal testing whatsoever, to kill the main series villain, to destroy the mystery around a character's obviously secret identity which was made secret so it could be dramatically paid off, to kill the previous series best character after making him chug nipple piss. And worst of all, who allowed this man to take an elderly woman and have her fly around in space like a fucking anime character? There was a large, looming mountain of damage that this film did to the entire Star Wars saga. And even if you love this movie, you should be able to, at its very least, absolutely be able to recognize how off the rails it took the series during a moment when literally everything was on the line. There is no greater um, moment seen in the Disney Star Wars trilogy. There is no greater microcosm 
of the failures that have followed this doomed fucking acquisition than the scene in The Last Jedi where Rey is supposed to be uh, having this Empire Strikes Back level um, revelation poured down upon her um, in this trippy cave that they like teed up in the trailers. Ooh, what's in this cave? And it turns out to be nothing, just hollow, endless stretches of nothing, beautiful, rendered perfectly, expensive, cascading walls of stone leading to crumbling nothingness at the end of nothing. None of this matters. It's a fucking mess, my God. And one day, I hope to have some kind of healthy relationship with The Last Jedi, but I'm not there. The wounds have not healed. The feelings are still hurt. And that is fucking... That's it. That's the one, guys. This is my last foray into discussing the theatrical Star Wars films until there is more to be had. Um, if you like this, please, good God, subscribe and do the thing, ring the bell, um, do the things that cost uh, you nothing but might mean everything to your boy behind the mic. And uh, with that, have a good holiday season. Love you all. Movie Blues, DS out.